Hi everyone, my name is Ms. Hu and I am your physics teacher. In this video, we're going to go through the concept of free fall at terminal velocity. Now, just to let you know, I'll be using my iPad and uh, because I'm using the iPad, you might find that there'll be a slight delay between what I say and what actually appears on screen. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And uh, the reason for the slight delay is, well, you know, internet issues, right? And for those of you who know me, you know that I'm a Jamboard teacher because I love to scribble all over the Jamboard. So without further ado, let's begin. Now, before we even start to understand the concept of free fall and terminal velocity, we will first of all need to recall this particular formula. If you've already learned this, then you would know that this formula is based on Newton's second law of motion, which uh, states that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force applied and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Now, in this particular case, we're going to be focusing on the relationship between the force applied and the acceleration of the object. Why aren't we considering mass? Well, because let's assume that the mass of the object is constant. So, for example, if let's say we have an object that's moving, okay, and there's a force applied, which I'll label here as F for now, obviously it's going to make the object move, or let's say in this case it's going to accelerate. Now, of course, um, in this case, is it possible for the mass to change? Well, if you're comparing different situations, yes, of course, a greater mass could really uh, re result in a lower acceleration and vice versa. But for this particular discussion, let's assume that it's the same object that has a constant mass throughout the entire motion. So it's not going to be a situation where when the object's moving, you know, things start falling off and the mass decreases or you start throwing things on and the mass increases. No, none of that. All right. So assume a constant mass. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, of course, we need to establish uh, what the symbols mean in the formula. So I'm going to write that over here. Now, F is normally force. So that's measured in Newton. M is, of course, mass, SI unit of kilogram. And A is acceleration measured in units of meters per second squared. Now, I said F is normally force, but if let's say you have a situation where there are several forces acting on an object. So let's say in this diagram, I'm going to label it as F1 and let's have an opposite force F2, right? So if you have multiple forces, then, then how? Then what? So that's why um, F is actually not really force. F is net force or in other words, resultant force. So what's this net force or resultant force? It's actually the vector sum of all the forces, which means that if you have the forces, several forces acting on the object, you plus, minus what you need to, bada bing, bada boom, and then you'll get one value of force that, um, that's representative of all the forces acting on an object. That's the net force. So let's say in this particular case, we will take moving to the right as our main direction. So if F1 was greater, whoops, I wanted to use screen for this. I'm just going to change the color of my pen. If F1 was greater than F2, then we can argue that, oh, the net force of F is actually greater than zero. So if the net force is greater than zero, and we know that M is a constant, that means F will be affecting A in this case. So if F is greater than zero, this means that A would be greater than zero. Acceleration is greater than zero, which means what? The object is accelerating. Is it possible for F to be greater than F1? Why not? So let's say, now already has F1 on the left-hand side for you know uh, continuity. So F1 is now less than F2. And taking the direction to the right as our main direction, this means now that our net force is less than zero. So the net force is less than zero. That means negative value. Acceleration would be less than zero, meaning acceleration is now negative. So when it's negative, it could mean two things. One, it could be decelerating, decelerating, or it could be accelerating in the opposite direction. 
Is it possible for F1 to be equal to F2? Of course. And what this means is that the net force is zero. So the net force is zero, that means the acceleration is zero. So a zero acceleration could mean two things. One, the object could be stationary, or it could be moving with constant velocity. So understanding the relationship between the net force and acceleration like this would greatly help in understanding the graph, which we're going to look at on the next slide. So this slide is a speed time graph to show how the motion of a skydiver is as he jumps off a plane. So it's written here speed time, but um, depends on the syllabus actually. Some syllabus use speed time, some syllabus use velocity time. I'm going to just write that both here. So for instance, um, in my classes, we're doing IGCSE, so they'll be learning it as a speed time graph, but uh, some of you may learn it as a velocity time graph, So, which is more accurate. Well, um, because both are moving in the same direction, they're both moving downwards, both are accepted actually. Of course, the more accurate one is actually velocity time. But if you're using speed time, no problem with that as well. So anyway, um, so what is this graph showing? So this graph is showing you the motion of a skydiver as he's falling. So um, just for clarity, I'm just going to draw stuff here. I know Miss Ho's not great at drawing, but she's going to draw anyway. So let's say we've got the airplane here, and then we have a skydiver who's going to jump off the plane. Okay. So now as a skydiver jump off, jumps off the plane, the skydiver, sorry, the skydiver is initially going to be free falling. So what is free falling? Free falling is the situation where an object or a body is falling under the influence of gravity. That means falling with gravitational acceleration. So obviously in order to fall, there has to be a force that's making the, um, well in this case, making the person fall. So as a person is, um, is falling through air, the force that's making him fall to air is his weight. So his weight is pulling him down. Now, as he's falling, he's going to be encountering some uh, opposing force, which is the air resistance in this case. Now, the interesting thing about air resistance is that it can change. So um, let's just take it from even at ground level. We're not falling, but let's say you know where you are. So if you're stationary, obviously there's no air resistance. But as you're walking, you might not feel very much air resistance. But as you start to run, you can actually feel air resistance. And the faster you run, the greater the air resistance is. Correct? And that's uh, exactly what happens with a skydiver as well. So which means that the faster the speed the greater the air resistance. So for the skydiver, as he's falling initially, he starts off with an initial speed or initial velocity of zero, which means that he has zero air resistance. But as he falls faster and faster, the air resistance increases. So for the first part, I'm going to write that over here, right? So initially, the initial speed or velocity is zero. Therefore, the air resistance is zero. So now, the net force, which I'm just going to write it as F over here, is actually equal to the weight minus the air resistance. So we can see that, oh, okay, well, uh, when the air resistance is zero, that means the net force is equal to the weight. And what we'll find is that, yes, as he's falling, the air resistance, um, sorry, the, as he's falling, he will encounter, um, what am I saying? So as he's falling, he's falling with gravitational acceleration. So for this part, I'm just going to label this as part A. It's falling. Ching, 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 ching. So this part here is where he's falling with gravitational acceleration. So it's kind of a straight line because... You know, he's following the gravitational acceleration, the speed or velocity is increasing at a constant rate. But here's the thing, we know that as his speed or velocity increases, the air resistance increases as well. So I'm just going to add that here. Okay. So as the air resistance increases, I'm just going to draw an arrow here to 
uh, represent the increase. So as the air resistance increases, the weight doesn't change. But because the air resistance increases, this causes the net force to decrease. So as the, uh, the what do you call the net force decreases, this causes the acceleration to decrease as well. So he's still going to be increasing in his speed or velocity, but it's just that his acceleration will be decreasing. And that's when you'll see in this part of the graph. So you can see that based on the gradient, the gradient is decreasing to become eventually zero. At this point, he's experiencing decreasing acceleration. Let me label this part as part A first. Okay, so... Uh, wait, let me, I, I need to write on top. So I'm just going to shift the B to the bottom part of that section of the graph, like so. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so acceleration is decreasing. And the thing about air resistance is that air resistance, the because it's not a force that exists on its own, it's a force that exists because of motion and because of the existence of other forces, which means that air resistance increases only because weight exists. Therefore, air resistance cannot be greater than the force that creates it. So air resistance cannot be greater than weight. So the air resistance will increase until it becomes equal To the weight. So I'm just going to maybe increase. Okay, increases until it equals to the weight. So just indicating this little arrow here to show. Yep, the air resistance increases until it becomes equal to the weight. So when the air resistance is equal to the weight, that means that the net force is now zero, which means that acceleration is zero. So when the acceleration is zero, it's now, uh, we now find that the skydiver is moving with constant speed or constant velocity. So at this section, which I will label as section C, because it's a constant speed, this is known as, okay, this value that we get here, this would be known as the terminal. Okay, it's not allowing me to put dots. Terminal velocity. So terminal velocity means the value of the constant speed or velocity of an object that uh, is moving through air due to the balance of the air resistance and the weight. Or in other words, just simply the constant velocity due to the equal weight and air resistance. So that's why this is known as the terminal velocity. Now, obviously, when the skydiver is falling, and now, although he's moving at constant velocity, it's still not safe because it's a very high value, right? He's increased his speed until he's reached, you know, that very high value of velocity, which is constant. And if he keeps up, you know, with that value of velocity and he hits the ground, okay, okay, cannot, not safe. So obviously, um, you know, skydivers have to carry parachutes with them, so they're going to open the parachute, right? So let's say, it, uh, you know, like at a certain point, he pachong, open, here's the open parachute. Ah, uh, parachute. So when he opens a parachute, obviously, uh, there's going to be a sudden change to his motion. So it is at this point where he suddenly opens his parachute. Now, because we know that parachute has a very high surface area, okay, so, sorry. Okay, so because we know that parachute has a very high surface area, that's obviously going to be creating a very high amount of air resistance. So I'm going to draw this with little red arrows over here. So these red arrows now represent the air resistance. Okay. That's one of the problems with iPad. It doesn't let me draw dots. Okay, so um, there's going to be a very high air resistance when the parachute suddenly opens. And at this point, suddenly the air resistance suddenly becomes much greater than the weight. So while he still has his same weight, the weight doesn't change, right? Because his mass hasn't changed. The air resistance is now much, much 
greater than the weight. So if we recall what we've learned in the previous slide, okay, taking downwards as our main direction, we now know okay, the net force we're talking about is moving downwards, right? Um, so if the weight is greater than the air resistance, yes, F is taken as moving down. But now, air resistance is greater than the wind, air resistance is going upwards. But he's still going to be moving down, still falling downwards, right? So at this point, his net force, F, is less than zero. And because F is less than zero, A is less than zero. And remember, there's two motions, right? He could be decelerating or he could be moving acceleration in the opposite direction. So in this case, we're going to, uh, under, you know, like we look at it in this case and we say, okay, He's still moving downward. So what's going to happen is, is actually he's decelerating. Because he's decelerating, we'll find that his speed of velocity suddenly drops. And that's exactly what is shown in this graph here. It suddenly drops. So this is part D, where he suddenly decelerates. But if you recall, hmm, didn't Miss Ho just say that the air resistance cannot be greater than the weight? Yes. Under normal circumstances, this is one of those cases where, at an instant, the air resistance is greater than the weight, but it can't stay greater than the weight. So what's going to happen is that air resistance is going to drop until it matches the value of the weight. So when we open a parachute, initially, pop for that quick moment in time, air resistance is more than the weight, but it will quickly drop until it becomes equal to the weight. So that's why you find that the gradient of this graph is very sharp and it suddenly drops down to a certain value. So what's going to happen here is the air resistance will drop until it's equal to the weight. So at this point where the air resistance is equal to the weight, okay, the net force is going to be equal to zero and therefore the acceleration is also equal to zero. So is he still moving? Yes, moving with constant velocity. Um, so that's why the acceleration is zero. So at this point, he has another value of terminal velocity because at this point also, um, his air resistance and his weight are balanced and he's moving with constant speed or velocity. So that's why this is also known as terminal velocity. So what this graph shows us is, number one, it shows us how the skydiver is free falling and the section of the graph that shows a free fall. And we find from the graph, there are two values of terminal velocities. The first terminal velocity is the terminal velocity achieved by the skydiver without a parachute. And the second terminal velocity is the value of the terminal velocity when the parachute is open. So I hope that you found this video helpful in understanding the speed time or velocity time graph of a skydiver. And if, you, if there's still a lot of stuff that uh, you need help with, please feel free to check with your physics teacher in class. So if you have enjoyed this video, uh, of course, feel free to uh, consider being a patron at my coffee uh, at Physics Rocks. And uh, otherwise, if you want to do the free thing to help me, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel um, right here. So if you like this video, click like. If you, like, uh, if you really enjoyed all my videos, please click subscribe. Greatly appreciate uh, any uh, subscription that you could give. Right? So uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you found this video helpful. And enjoy studying.